Welcome to video three of chapter seven. In this video, we will look at information processing. Information processing involves the processes that allow us to take in information, manipulate it in our minds, and think about how we are doing so. These processes include attention, memory, executive function, and metacognition. We will look at these topics now. These are not the only topics that are studied in the, in the area of information processing. For instance, they would look at things also like problem solving and decision making. Um, to just language is also studied in information processing. So we're just going to look at some of the processes involved in, in the study of information processing. Um, it is a information processing as a whole is about just how we get information into our system, our brains, how we, you know, manip manipulate it and store it and use it. And, you know, we use it for problem solving, decision making and, and for language and, and, and how we retrieve it, information when we need it. So it's all about the flow of information into and out of the human brain and what we do with it when it's in there. Okay, let's look at these specific topics and, and look at some, some of the development of them, beginning with attention. Uh, paying attention involves tuning in to certain things while tuning out others. We call this selective attention, paying attention, you know, to what's important in the in the environment or in the situation that you're in. It also involves maintaining focus over time so that we call that sustained attention. Um, these are both important um, important aspects of attention uh, to, to develop in order to allow us to become smarter <laughs> and to learn more. Uh, you have to be able to pay attention at times and hold it, and you have to know what to pay attention to, which is the selective attention. Okay, uh, let me look at my notes here for a minute. Okay, infants, um, um, inf we'll talk about attention in infancy, and infants prefer novelty. Um, remember, I just talked about in the last video, I talked about how uh, infants look longer at things that are surprising to them or unexpected to them. Well, it turns out that they also look longer at things that are newer. Because if you think about it, something that's new is also, you know, more surprising or unexpected as well. So, so we we've known for a long time that this is um, a result that we can expect if they they will look longer at something that they've never seen before versus something that they're familiar with, for instance. Um, habituation, I talked about this briefly in the last video. That is when there's a reduction in response to, to a repeated stimuli. Basically, the, the infant's losing attention. So if I, the first time I hold up, let's say, a, a doll in front of an infant. They're very interested in it. They, they have tons of attention. They, they want to hold it and do things. And, um, but if I keep, you know, presenting that doll over and over and over again, you know, eventually they're going to lose some interest in it. And, and that is called habituation. When they reach that point of, okay, you've shown it to me a hundred times, I, you know, I'm not even going to pay attention anymore. Um, as infants get older, they they will tend to habituate more quickly to something so they they lose interest quicker um so what this results in is that they're you know if you're testing if you're using um you know um, if you testing let's say for sustained attention this is where i want to go um, um you know it almost appears like Oh, older infants have less sustained attention. I mean, they turn away quicker. They they lose interest quicker. So, 
Well, we know that this is because they habituate to things quicker. So it's not really that they have poor sustained attention. They're just, they're just getting bored, you know, quicker. Um, so we, we know this because if you show these older infants um, more complex stimuli, so let's say you show them something like a Sesame Street video, um, their sustained attention increases beyond what, what a younger infant would have. So, so they do habituate quicker, meaning that at times it appears like the sustained attention goes down, but it's only because the stimuli is not uh, complex or interesting enough. If you show them very complex stimuli, certainly their sustained attention has, has grown during the first year of life. They can pay attention to complex stimuli for long periods. Okay. Um, attention in childhood. Um, the ability to direct and sustain attention increases as children grow. Uh, both sustained and select, selective attention increase greatly as children move into middle childhood. And both of those are linked to achievement in math and reading. Um, one interesting result is that even at the age of four, the ability to maintain focused attention is linked to achievement in college. So four-year-olds that, that have the ability to maintain focused attention are more likely to uh, show greater achievement in college versus those four-year-olds that do not have good sustained attention. Uh, this makes sense. If at four you already have a good ability to focus and maintain your attention, it's going to help you throughout all of your childhood and adolescence and all of your schooling. You know, um, students do certainly do better. I just told you that, you know, it's related to, to ability, achievement in math and reading. So sustained, atten sustained and selective attention are both very important abilities that develop in childhood. Um, the Stroop test is something that is used to assess selective attention. Um, I'll just show you an example of it. And I apologize for using a website for kids, neuroscience for kids, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a simple, straightforward look at the, the Stroop test. And basically, you're given a list of words. As shown here, the words are colored. Um, and they also spell colored words. And your task is to name the, the, the color that like the ink color of each word, um, rather than reading the words. And so you could try this. And, and if you actually go to this website, um, and um, in case you can't see it, uh, okay, you can see up here, um, faculty.washington.edu, uh, chudlerwords.html. Okay, anyways, you can try it. You, you can actually time yourself on this website and, um, and, and do like a series of interactive tests uh, that will show that, that you slow down when you're reading the color of, of words that spell colors that don't match the actual, you know, ink color. So, so just in case you to make the task clear, like if, if you look at that middle column, you know, the top word says green, but you would say blue as you go through the list and when it, where it says red, uh, you would say yellow because it's, it's colored yellow. So you, you, so this is a test of, of, of really of selective attention. Um, because you have to, you're selecting what to pay attention to. You you do best by paying attention just to the colors that you see rather than what the words say. But it's harder than it seems because unfortunately, I mean, like you, it's impossible at, at, at your point in development to look at a word without reading it. I mean, at least internally reading it. I mean, seriously, try to look at any of the words on the screen right now 
and don't read them. I mean, if you, if you actually like, you know, focus on any single word that you can see on the screen right now, just focus on for a moment. I mean, you know what the word is as soon as you focus on it. Like, it's not like you have to put effort into, you know, reading from left to right. And I mean, you automatically, at this point, you automatically read words. So that interferes with this color naming, naming task. Um, so if you, but if you have better selective attention, you, you know, you can tend to ignore the reading of the words a little bit more and you can name the colors faster. Okay. So anyways, give this a try if you get a chance. That is this troop test. Back to where we were here. Uh, there are a lot of individual differences in attention abil abilities in childhood. We know that these are partially genetic, so nature, uh, but they're also related to differences in parenting that are related to socioeconomic status. Um, it turns out that, that low, in low income mothers tend to experience more parenting stress and this causes them to provide less stimulation and support to their children um, and if children are stimulated less, this will affect the development of their attention. So think about it when, when I talk about stimulating, like just interacting with your child, like you are, they are learning to attend because you'll be doing things like holding stuff up to them. Hey, look at this doll, you know, and, 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 and so then they, they try to, you know, they shift their attention to what you're holding. And, and if you, if you keep talking about, it, they'll try to sustain their attention. So by interacting with young children, you're actually helping to increase their attentional skills because you're pointing things out to them in the environment. You're like having them shift their attention from one thing to another. Um, so it turns out that that because, um, and this is certainly not true, obviously, of every everyone in this category, but overall, low-income mothers experience more parenting stress and provide less stimulation and support to the children. And, and this can cause um, less development of their attentional processes. Um, processing efficiency or automaticity. Um, well, we just saw an example of that with the Stroop test. I told you that, you know, you can't look at a word without reading it because you're a skilled reader. You've spent years reading. And so reading has become automatic to you. Uh, you don't have to try to read something. You just look at it and you automatically read it. So automaticity means doing skills without much conscious thought. You just do them without thinking about them. And this, as different tasks become more automatic, this frees up processing capacity. Um, and so you, you know, if certain things are automatic, you, you have more room and, and, time to think about other things. Um, so uh, you can, you know, you can spread your attention more. Um, uh, if you're doing something, if, if one of the things you're doing is automatic, you could also be doing something else. So like when you're walking, for instance, walking's pretty automatic. <laughs> I mean, you don't think about your motions, you're just heading somewhere and you, your legs are doing it and you're walking. I mean, really, you're sending little commands to every muscle, you know, to, in order to move your legs and to walk, but you don't have to consciously think about it. So while you're walking, you can have a conversation or, you know, or do, I don't know, daydream or, or listen to music or do something else because it doesn't take any effort to, to make your legs move and to walk. Just like, you know, other certain other skills become automatic. Um, driving, if you've spent years already driving, and the more time or the more number of years you've spent driving, then, then the more it becomes automatic. So you don't think about any of the individual motions anymore. You just think about where you're heading. I want to turn left up here and, and your arms just move and your, your, you know, your, your foot does the appropriate response on the, on the pedals and your arms turn the wheel appropriately to make the left turn. You're just thinking about where you're going and you're watching for cars. But you're, you're not actually thinking, okay, I have to move this arm in this direction. I have to move this leg in this direction. I mean, it, it be, those things become automatic. Okay. So 
once again, as, as skills become automatic, it frees up processing capacity for to do other things. Now, there is a, a myth in, in that often exists in ad, among adolescents, and probably some of you share in this myth. And it's the belief that it's called the multitasking myth. It's a belief that you can attend to several things at the same time and, you know, and attend to them um, adequately in order to, let's say, learn them. So you could watch TV and do your homework at the same time or study at the same time, for instance, would be an example of multitasking. Oh, I'm still studying just as good as if I was didn't have the TV on. I mean, okay, anyways, this is a myth. Um, because you really are, n are not attending to, to two things at once when you multitask. You're really switching back and forth between them, often very quickly. So it's like your attention, your attention goes to what you're reading, and then it goes to the TV, goes back to what you're reading, goes to the TV. Like, and it, it can be very quick switching, switching. So it feels like you're doing both at once, perhaps, but you're really not. You're doing one and then the other, and then and back to the first one. And um, anyways, when you are switching back and forth like that you do less deep processing of either task or of any of the tasks that you multitask in between. Um, you actually, they, they've shown in brain scans that you, you don't activate a part of your brain that's designed for deep processing. You use a different part of your brain when you multitask that's designed for superficial rapid processing. So we do have a certain part of our brain that's, that's meant to you know, allow us to switch um, our, our attention quickly. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, I don't wait, let's say when you're driving, you at times you're going to engage that superficial part of your brain to, to, you know, because you're quickly scanning the environment, you're reacting to, to what the car is doing in front of you. I mean, like you're, you're, and, and you might also be, uh, you know, you're watching for people, um, and you're like you, you're doing a number of, of little tasks at a time, and, you, and it's okay because you don't have to learn a lot during that time that you're driving. You have to drive safely, and it, the superficial part of your brain to switch from one thing to another it, it can actually be helpful. But if you're trying to actually learn something and you're multitasking, you need that deep processing part of your brain, and it does not become activated while multitasking, and that means anything you learn during the time is going to be far less memorable. You're not forming good, solid, um, what's called consolidated long-term memories. So this, so that, that multitasking that I can do two things just as well as, you know, at once, just as well as if I was just doing one is, is completely a myth. Um, speaking of, of multitasking, they looked at the re reaction time for, for people who talk or text while, on their cell phone while driving. And they found that it's actually slower than the reaction times of drunk drivers. So you're better off driving drunk than talking or texting on your cell phone while you drive, um, according to this research. And I don't recommend either, obviously. Um, but unfortunately, 49% of young adults do text while driving. Um, I would suggest that texting is, is even worse than talking on the phone, although they are both bad. So 49%, you know, half of young adults engage in this, in this dangerous activity that slows down reaction time to less than a drunk. Okay, uh, let's go on. Um, ADHD, let's talk about that so while we're on the subject of attention. It's a, most people know what it is, a, a disorder marked by extreme difficulty with inattention, impulsivity, or a combination of both. Um, and there are those, those three different, you know, kind of subtypes. Like some people, it's mainly just the inattention. Others, it's mainly the impulsivity or hyperactivity. And then there's, you know, the, the more common is that, is that you have both at once, but you can just have one or the other. Okay. Um, 
about 5% of children are diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, boys are twice as likely as girls to receive the diagnosis. And um, I wanted to point out this, this result here. Um, there was a study done and it appears from the study that as you age from early childhood, you know, into middle childhood and then early and late adolescence, it appears that the hyperactive impulsive symptoms decrease um, significantly, whereas the inattentive systems min min are maintained at a fairly constant level. So you see that top line is the inattentive symptoms. The yellow line is the hyperactivity impulsive impulsivity symptoms. Um, it turns out that this was this is um, really um, not a true result. I mean, a um, or let me put it different. It's 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 not it's not an accurate representation of what's actually happening. Um, it's just that the reason that you get a result like this is that the hyperactive impulsivity symptoms just become far less noticeable to others as you get as you age from early childhood up to late adolescence. Think about what an, how an early childhood demonstrates hyperactive impulsive symptoms. I mean, they run around the room and and yell and then you know like misbehave and. Um, you know, create a nuisance. I mean, like, 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 almost like out of control behavior. Um, an adolescent may have just as high level hyperactive impulsive symptoms, but over over time, they've learned not to run around the room and, and misbehave and cause a nuisance. And, and so they, what's happened is that they just do th behaviors that are less noticeable, such as fidgeting or restlessness versus running around the room uncontrollably. And so when you actually look at the amount of, you know, fidgeting and restlessness that goes on, I mean, it turns out that they haven't really lost their hyperactivity or impuls impulsivity as this result suggested initially. Um, it's just become more hidden. Okay. A um, couple more points here. As children with ADHD get older, the symptoms may change or lessen as they move into adulthood, but ADHD cannot be cured. Uh, rarely does it completely ever go away, only in you know, very unique cases. Um, research shows that, that stimulants such as Ritalin or Adderall are effective in increasing attention and reducing problem behaviors for many children. Okay, the next information processing topic is memory. And um, you would have learned back in 101 that about the, the three store model of memory that's been around for decades of that basically we have, you know, three different uh, a sequence of three different types of memory. Information starts in your sensory memory. Uh, this is all the information that comes in through your senses and it's maintained for a very brief time in its raw form. So like, you know, I can actually hear um, a copy of whatever I've listened to during the last two seconds or so. Um, and, and for vision, you know, like if I close my eyes, whatever I was just looking at, you know, I can, I can still see it after my eyes are closed. But that's for less than a second. You you know more more like a half a second or so that's available. So, but it's all the information. Like it's not like when I close my eyes, I, I can just see one thing I was looking at. I mean, everything like the the whole the whole visual field is available for a moment in my sensory memory. It's it's like a copy of what I was just looking at. Sim similarly with sound, you know, you you have a little recording of everything you've heard in the last couple of seconds. Okay, that's your sensory memory. But it just, you know, it disappears quickly. It keeps getting refreshed. I keep looking at new things. I keep getting new information going in there. Um, so that's a, a brief type of memory. 
Um, it's not, you know, it's very brief. But in order to remember something that I've just heard or looked at for a longer period, I have to pay attention to it. I just looked at attention. When I pay attention to something that's in my in my sensory memory, whether it's a sound, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, whether it's a sound or something I've just looked at. I move that information into the next memory store, working or short-term memory. Um, that's kind of like what you're thinking about right now. It's like your current, the, the, what you're currently holding in your mind. Uh, the capacity is limited to only brief, for only brief time, at most up to about 30 seconds. Can something just sit in there and, and you remember it? Um, but it also allows the mind to process information in order to move it into long-term memory using encoding processes. Um, the um, capacity of limited for working or short-term memory, you can only hold on average up to about seven different items in your working short-term memory. Um, so you know, you can't hold a lot of different thoughts or concepts, you know, at one time. Um, once again, you, you engage in encoding processes, some sometimes called deep processing. Um, this is what you're missing out on when you're doing the multitasking. You're not doing, you're not using um, uh, useful encoding processes while multitasking. You need, you need to engage that deep processing part of your brain, then you can encode the information at a deeper level, and this moves it into your long term memory. So you can remember it the next day or the next year or, you know, or perhaps for the rest of your life. When we do move information into long term memory by using encoding processes, um, we, it can possibly stay there and be remembered uh, permanently. You know, a 95 year old can still remember things that happened when they were five. There's no, there's no time limit on the memories. And um, so it's nearly a permanent retention and it seems to have no capacity limits. No one has ever topped up like, like my memory is full. I can't add even one more fact. I mean, like that's never happened. This is uh, <clears throat> And this is um, due, some, due to something we talked about in an earlier unit, brain plasticity. Because if your memory was just a filing system, like eventually you might run out of room, but remember your brain is changing as you learn new things. So it's like you're, it's like a filing system where that keeps adding more filing cabinets. I mean, like it, it, it keeps adding, it adds space as needed it, and it, it um, so your brain changes in response to, to learning and, and, and so you never run out of space. It can always create more pathways in your brain. Okay, um, okay so that's a three memory system. Just as a brief overview, let's look at some uh, developmental memory research. Uh, one researcher by the name of Robet Collier um, she used a paradigm that showed that six month olds can remember a stimulus for one week and 18 month olds a year and a half, they can remember for up to 13 weeks. Um, well, how did she test a, a baby's memory, a six month old? Well, what she did was she taught them a new skill. She um, had these, these babies were in the cribs and she hung a mobile over the crib, something that the baby was interested in. And, um, and she tied a, she had it rigged up. So she tied a string to their, their leg. And if they kicked their leg, it made the mobile spin. And so she would tie the string and eventually the baby would kick their leg and they would see it spin and they would learn to kick their leg more. And, and so, you know, after the child, after the, the infant had learned uh, to do this for a while, to that that they could kick their leg to make it make it spin, then she would you know take the mobile away and un unattach the string and and then come back after you know certain lengths of time to see would they remember to kick their leg when they when they see the mobile and this is how she found out that 
you know, they could remember for up to about a week. Um, with the 18 month olds, it was a more complex task. I mean, they 18, you know, a year and a half olds aren't necessarily laying, laying around in the crib, kicking their legs to, to make a mobile spin. So she taught them to, to do some kind of sequence to start a toy train. So she, she brought it with her and they learned how to, how to start it. And, you know, there was a couple of things you had to do to start it. And then she would take it away and come back after certain periods of time to see if they remembered how to start the train. And she, this is how she found that they could remember for approximately on 13 weeks on average. So some interesting research methods, you know, you can't really ask them verbally what they remember. It's, it's not, it's not a, you, you can't expect um, a six month old to report to you. So, so by teaching them skills to remember, she was able to test their memory in that way. Um, one interesting thing is that, is that we all experience is called infantile amnesia. Um, this is, you know, where the average person really has few or no memories before the age of three or so. Sometimes people have like a, a very brief, um, very brief like image or of a memory or, you know, a tiny sequence of a memory. Um, but very little memory is for most people remember very little before the age of three. And yet we just found out that infants can remember. Reve Collier showed that they actually have memory. I mean, they're remembering things for a week, you know, during the, at six months, or they're remembering things for three months when they were, when they're 18 months old, I mean, 13 weeks is over three months. So they have obviously have memory that's working. So why can't we remember things from that time of period in our life? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Well, there, there've been a number of, of interesting um, ideas put forth. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, share some of these with you about why we have infantile amnesia. Um, one is, is that the brain changes significantly in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex during development. And because of these significant brain changes, and those both those areas are important for, for memory, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, because they change so much as it kind of wipes out those earlier memories as, as these parts of the brain mature and, 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 and you know, kind of reorganize. Um, the second idea is, is uh, we undergo rapid pr production of new neurons in, in the hippocampus early in life. And, um, and so this production of, of new neurons, um, perhaps this is interfering with the existing organization of the neurons you already had. And if, if, if the neurons get reorganized, that interferes with your memory. So maybe because we're producing so many new neurons early in childhood, that is, it, it, it means that we, we, we can't keep a, uh, a, the memory structure intact. Okay, that's well, possible. A third idea is kind of interesting. Some people have hypothesized that we don't remember before the age of three because we don't have a clear sense of self during that time. And if you think about your memories, they're organized around the self, the concept of the self. Like if I think about a memory, like um, last week I went to the diner and I had a fish sandwich and then Bob came over and started talking to me about his wife. Anyways, um, you know, in that memory, I was at the diner, I was eating a fish sandwich, you know, Bob came over to me, all these little terms I'm using, are part of my sense of self. I was there, I was eating, you know, um, Bob approached me, came towards I. I mean, so like, if you don't have a sense of self and, and very young children, uh, you know, at, at least infants and, and toddlers really don't have a clear sense of self, that they're separate, you know, individual entities, uh, different from everyone else, you know, with their own minds. It takes a while for them to learn that, that they are, 
you know, and, and develop a sense of I am like a unique individual person. And so they don't really have that I term early in life to think to. And so they're storing memories. Like, I don't even know what the memory would look like if, if I couldn't use the concept of I, it'd be like, you know, somebody's eating a fish sandwich at the diner. Like, I mean, like, you know, you wouldn't even have the concept of somebody, but like, it's like you just kind of maybe have an image of a fish sandwich. So, I mean, there's no, it takes away from the story aspect of our memories. Our personal memories are kind of organized around stories. I was at a birthday party. I did this, I did that. You know, like it's about your, you know, your, your actions. It's about what you experienced and you organize them around the concept of yourself. So this, I thought this one was interesting. No clear sense of self. And so the memories were stored very differently than what we use after we have a sense of self. And finally, one more is, and this has to do with language development. And, and there's a theory put forth that um, perhaps infants use nonverbal processes to store their memories. And actually, they, they would have to before they have language. Um, when we store memories as older children or adolescents or adults, we actually use la our language abilities to help store our memories. Like, you know, I already mentioned, like, you know, like, our memories are kind of built around the concept of I and what you were doing. And, and we often have words attached to our memories. If I'm trying, trying to remember a frog I saw on the on the expressway the other day, I'd be like, I'm going to have the word frog attached to that memory and, and the word expressway. And like, like, like we use words to help tag our memories and so we can find them again. And, and um, if you don't have well-developed language yet, as young children don't, then perhaps they don't have the language tags to, in order to revisit and find the memories. So I, another interesting theory. Okay. Um, let's go on. You could read, uh, look that up. You could read more about it on the internet if you want. It's an interesting topic. Okay, memory in childhood now. Um, so in childhood, uh, working memory gets larger. It continues to get larger throughout childhood. Working memory, that's once again, you know, the middle stage of memory. What's, what's in your mind right now? I told you that we can hold about seven items. Well, that's an adult. Younger children, it's much less. Like a, a, a two-year-old um, or a two-and-a-half-year-old can only hold about two items in their, in their mind at one time. So, it, you know, it spans from two items, you know, when you're about two or two-and-a-half, you know, up to seven items when you're an adult. So, like, working memory grows, gets larger um, throughout childhood. So that's going to uh, certainly help your memory as you can hold more items at once. Uh, in your working memory. Um, secondly, um, the second thing that's changing throughout childhood to increase our memory abilities is your processing speed increases. Our brains get faster. Um, as the brain um, starts reorganizing, and especially after pruning starts in, in, in middle childhood and our brains start to become more efficient, myelination has taken place, which, which increases the processing speed your brain as well. So like our brains get faster during de de development and a faster brain is, it means that like you could move information in and out of your working memory more quickly. So it's like, even though it might not be as um, at its full capacity yet, like maybe you're only up to five or six items in childhood, but if you have a faster processing brain, like you're moving things in and out quicker, it means like you can think about more in a, in a short time period. Like Anyway, so our memory is going to increase both as working memory gets gets larger, processing speed increases. Um, the third thing that's going to help with our memory is we develop strategies, encoding strategies. You learn to use certain strategies to help remember things. You know, um, and these develop over time, especially after you start schooling and you're forced to remember things. Uh, one thing we do is we start forming scripts. Um, earlier in this chapter, I talked about Piaget's theory and I talked about schemas. A script is just what the information processing people call an event schema. Remember, I used the example of going to a restaurant. We all have that 
that schema in our minds of what to expect. Well, this is what an information processing researcher would call a script. It's basically you learn certain sequences of what to expect, sequences of events. And that, and so that actually, you know, frees up, frees your mind, your, your attention up to, to learn other things and to remember other things. Uh, okay, repetition rehearsal. Um, you know, eventually, fairly early on, we when we have to remember things, we start to learn to repeat them to ourselves uh, over and over in your in your conscious working memory. So it's like a phone number, for instance, I, you know, 978-03-810-89, okay, 89-973-0389, you know, like I could repeat that for a while in order to remember it. Um, Organization and association is something we is a skill we develop. This means that we start to, when we need to remember things, we organize the information to make it easier to remember. So if I give you a list of six colors to remember, so I want you to remember blue, bronze, red, gold, white, and silver. Well, you know, maybe you can still remember those, maybe not, but if you took a quick glance at the list, you would probably instantly engage in a in an organization process. You would notice that, hey, three of the colors are red, white, and blue. I can remember the, that, red, white, and blue easily. And three of the colors are gold, silver, and bronze. Well, that's pretty easy to remember. So like, a little organization makes it far more easy, far easier to remember than six individual colors. And so this is something we start to learn to automatically do as we get encounter new information that we want to remember, we reorganize it in, in ways that make sense. Often chunking together pieces of information like red, white, and blue becomes just one item instead of three. And gold, silver, bronze is just one item to remember instead of three, once again. Okay. Uh, and then elaboration. Um, elaboration, I, I kind of mentioned when I was talking about the memory systems that just to backtrack, you know, we talked about encoding processes. Encoding processes, elaboration is an encoding process. Processy. It means that you're th thinking more deeply about information that you need to remember. And elaborating on it means that you're uh, you, you're like maybe personalizing it. Uh, for instance, let's say you were to write a reflection essay and you were to take information that you just learned and you personalize it, well, that's that's a, a form of elaboration. You've elaborated on what you learned and it becomes much more memorable. Um, other types of elaboration um, are um, like a, a attaching what you're learning to, to things that you already know. Well, actually you're doing that with the reflection essays as well, but you know, it you, you know, it's like you're hooking new information to old information. So um, when I talked about um, assimilation and accommodation. Remember I talked about the young child that had a schema for birds and, and they knew that they had wings and, and that they, um, and that they could fly. And then they, they found out that butterflies are different. And so they had to add, you know, they, they also have beaks. Well, this, in, in this case, their, their concept for birds has, has become more elaborate more elaborate. And the fact that beaks, that birds, excuse me, that birds have beaks, it's not like a separate fact that they have to remember, they're attaching it to the schema that they've already formed. So one form of elaboration is that you're, is when you ha already have schemas in place, you're just adding information to them and connecting to them rather than forming brand new schemas. Um, okay, anyways, our capacity to process just to, to repeat one thing and make a connection to Piaget, our capacity to process information in childhood is limited by how much we can hold in our working memory and by our, our processing speed. So I told you those two things are changing. This is related um, to Piaget's idea of centration. Remember we watched the video, um, when we looked at the conservation um, conservation tasks, like the water task and the coins task, 
and I mentioned centration, that, that young children were only paying attention to one dimension of a problem. Well, the, the reason this is related to working, uh, working memory capacity and, and processing speed is that they can only hold you know, one dimension in, in mind at a time. They just did not have, they do not have the, the capacity, they don't have the, like the, the um, working memory in place to com compare um, the, the glasses of water, for instance, on, on more than one dimension. It's too much for their minds to hold. This is why they can't do it. So the reason they centrate is because they have limited the space in their work in their conscious like um, in the conscious working memory. They can only concentrate on one thing at a time because that's the only the only space they have. Basically, right. anyways, I mean, in a sense, that's how they relate. So it's kind of like a um, a memory limitation is is why centration occurs in the first place. Okay, let's move on. That's probably overly complex. Um, oh, this, this picture is definitely out of place, but here we see a picture just, uh, you know, I, I didn't even know, look at this picture before, but here we see a picture of a baby with the, the string tied to, uh, tied to its leg. So this was from the Reve Collier exper experiment. I should move it to the right slide, but so this is one of those six month old babies like, like it's learning to kick its leg to make the mobile spin. Okay, anyways, um, yeah, I didn't even realize. Okay, anyways, uh, memory in childhood, um, knowledge base increases. Um, obviously, as you learn more throughout childhood. And, and so as you gain more, uh, like a, a wider base of knowledge, um, new information is, is is much easier and can be remembered much better um, if you already have a solid knowledge base in that area. So, for instance, if I learn something new about psychology, I I kind of fit it in where it goes in my. I have a you know a vast array of schemas about psychological concepts because you know I've I've, I've lived in and taught in psychology for for decades. And so when if we both learn something new at the same time, I got places to put it like where it just fits in with other stuff I already know. Um, and whereas you might be forming a brand new schema, I would be doing more like assimilation. And and so so um, when you have a broader knowledge base, you you do engage more in assimilation, which is just kind of like you're adding little facts like that that kid adding that the birds have beaks to his beak category he didn't really have to do a lot of changing of, of that bird category um because he it, it was already in place and so he he added the fact that they also have beaks you know and end up uh, and this is the same and this is in any area when you have a knowledge base in place it's more like you're assimilating just adding to your schemas rather than inventing and you know, constructing whole new schemas, uh, which you you have to do if you're in a brand new area where you have no background knowledge. Okay, so so just as children learn more, their learning increases. You 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 learn to learn. You you get faster at learning, and mem and this is going to obviously expand your memory. Okay, uh, younger children are susceptible to false memories. In fact, it's fairly easy to create false memories with, with preschoolers in particular. Um, a, you can convince a preschooler that something actually happened if you get them to imagine the event, the event over and over. Um, they, they've done this in, in a number of experiments. One, in one of them, they had children think about um, a blue a balloon ride that they had with their, I don't know, uncle or grandfather or something. And in in this experiment, they actually like created a digital picture of them in a, in a hot air balloon with like a, a family member, like an uncle or a grandfather, and 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 they just had they would convince the, the they would tell the children to think about think about 
um, going on a hot air balloon ride with you with your grandfather or whoever. And, and if they thought about it over and over, it, it, would, it would become a memory to them. And they would actually believe that, yes, they got on a hot air balloon ride before, and even though they never had, but you could, you could actually create that memory in these children, which is really fascinating that, that just by thinking about something enough, you can create a new memory that, and, and these memories are indistinguishable from real memories. They're, they seem just as real, they seem just as detailed, and your confidence is the same in them in many cases. So um, I don't know, just um, this is one of the things that's been researched because, you know, we, um, it's been researched because it's very important for, for when young children become eyewitness test, they, when they become eyewitnesses and do testimony in court or something, uh, often they bring in um, experts on, on, on childhood memory to, to talk about how easily it is to implant memories in young children. And so like even, even something like the way you ask them a question, um, if you say something like, if you ask a, a child enough times, did you see that man punch that other man? And even though they didn't see it, if you keep asking them and getting them to think about it, all of a sudden they, they're going to develop a memory and say, yeah, I saw him punch him, even though they, even though they never did. Um, okay, anyways, well, let's go on. Memory in adolescence, we'll briefly talk about this. Uh, Long-term and working memory reach their peak capacity at around age 11 or 12. So working memory gets up to about that average, on average, seven items around the age of 11 or 12. They don't change much after this. Uh, Long-term memory, once again, becomes such that you can store as much as you want in, into it. Um, okay, uh, going on here. What does change, however, is the way that the brain manages working memory. Um, this is just a slight difference that I'll point out. Um, when working on a memory task, younger adolescents use both the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. I mentioned these areas before when I was talking about infantile amnesia. So they use both areas, it's the same as children do, prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. By about age 18, we we only use the prefrontal cortex when we start, when we remember things. The hippocampus is still involved in memory, but in a memory task, we don't actually use it anymore. Memories of memories get transferred away from the hippocampus. So when you remember something, you don't engage that part of your brain like you do in childhood. So the way that we we manage working memory, and like when we bring, you know, we, when we want to think about memories, when we want to like. Uh, uh, try to remember things, it, the, the brain functioning actually actually changes. So once again, during childhood and early adolescence, use both prefrontal cortex, hippocampus. After 18 and throughout adulthood, you only use the prefrontal cortex to engage memories. Um, okay, that's one. Just um, a couple more topics. Executive function this is um, um, this is basically talking about your control center in your brain. It, it court, your executive function coordinates your attention, kind okay, of co controls and coordinates it. Your, also your memory, and and it controls behavioral responses for the purpose of attaining a certain goal. So your your executive function is kind of uh, you know the your planner. You want to attain a goal, so you you organize your, your, you know, your attention and, um, and you use your memory, memory in order to you know, attain the goal you're after. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, once again, it's your control center. So it does things like inhibition. It's responsible for cognitive flexibility. It's responsible for planning. Um, let's look at each of these briefly. Inhibition is the ability to stay on task and ignore distractions. So that takes control. That's your control center, your executive function. I'm going to, I have to keep working on this. I have to, you know, stay focused on this. Um, they test ch children's inhibition uh, control with um, 
an interesting simple task. Um, I'll, I'll just mention there, there's there's a few different experiments I've heard about. I'm, I'm just going to mention one of them. There is called the uh, the hammer tap task, and they give a child a you know a, a a toy hammer, and the adult the in charge you know also has a toy hammer, and basically what the child has to do is if the adult taps his hammer once, the child has to tap their hammer twice. And if the adult taps twice, the child has to tap their hammer once. And so this is inhibition control because it'd be much easier just to, to copy the adult, right? So that you, even, you know, you, and that's kind of your first impulse is, is just to copy what, what, the, what the other person did. So you have to inhibit that response to do the correct response. And so they see how, how accurately and quickly children can do it. And this is testing their level of inhibition control. Can they can control their impulses? Uh, cognitive flexibility is, is the ability, ability to switch focus as you need to, need to, excuse me, in order to complete a task. Um, they, one way that they test this is they um, do a little sorting task with with young children and um, so imagine like there's this little conveyor belt and items are coming along the conveyor belt and they have to sort them by color okay so some of the and so and there, there's all these different shapes but some of them are green some are red some are blue maybe some are yellow anyways and they have different bins that they can put them in so they put all the yellow ones and red ones and blue ones together you know like in, they sort them by color and then all of a sudden, somebody says, wait a sec, you, now you have to sort them by shape. And so all of a sudden they have to switch what they've been thinking about and, and they got to put the triangles together and the squares together and the, the circles together, even though they, they, they'll be, you know, the colors will be mixed. This is called inflexibility. Can you switch from one thing that was, you were attending to like one task to, you know, another task. And this is also actually, testing their inhibition because they might want to continue like doing what they were originally doing. They have to, they have to fight that impulse and inhibit it. But also, so cognitive flexibility, you know, can you, can you easily switch, which, you know, from one set, set of instructions you're operating on to another, can you? Um, and anyways, um, one thing that they found just to bring it up here is that, and we'll talk about this actually in another chapter as well, but um, bilinguals, uh, those that learn a second language early in life, uh, one of the things that helps with is that they is cognitive flexibility. They tend to have greater cognitive flexibility, people that learn two languages early in life. And that makes sense because they're constantly switching from one language to the other. Like, you know, when I say constantly, I mean, like, you know, uh, if they're natural bilinguals, then they're probably here in both languages. Um, at, at different times, like during a day or at least during the same week. And they're switching back and forth and they're, they're translating things in their head. Um, and that gains them better cognitive flexibility skills, which is, which is all about switching, you know, from one set of rules to another. It's like from one grammar to another grammar or one syntax to another syntax. Okay, um, and, then, and then planning is thinking through a task ahead of time and then evaluating the outcomes as you proceed through the task, changing what you're doing as necessary. One, uh, one thing that they use sometimes to test this is the Tower of Hanoi task. This is where there's a, a series of, of pegs and they have rings on them. All the rings um, start on one peg and they're all slightly different size, sizes. So it goes from you know, a small circle to a somewhat bigger circle underneath it, to a somewhat bigger circle underneath that. And there's different levels of complexity. You could you could just do it with three rings and three pegs. And the idea is to to move those three rings from from the leftmost peg to the rightmost peg. Given that you can never put a larger circle on top of a smaller circle. Now, in order to do it correctly. It takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It takes seven moves. 
um, to do it as quick as possible. But if you don't plan ahead, if you make the wrong move, it's going to take you more than seven moves. So you have to actually get, so they, they use that, you know, with older children or adolescents to test their planning skills um, and see if they can think ahead to, to, to know, you know, what the first step is to, to do it as, as quickly as possible. Anyways, and, and by the way, you can do four pegs with four circles. You can do five pegs with five circles. It gets more and more complex if, if you want it to be. But it's an example of planning ahead. Okay, let's go on. Metacognition just refers to the ability, ability to think about and monitor one's own thoughts and cognitive activities. Sometimes you'll hear this as thinking about thought. Metacognition, thinking about thought. Okay. And is it, it really, that's what it is. Um, you know, kind of monitoring your own thinking process um, and, and adjusting it as necessary. Um, like all simple example, you're studying for a test, uh, you got 10 chapters to read, you to, to study, you got 10 hours to study and, and then you've just spent two hours on the on the first chapter. You know, if you have, you could just keep going at the same way you are, but you obviously go around run out of time. If you have metacognition, you go think, okay, I'm spending too much time. I have to reduce my time on each chapter. I, I, I need to skip some sections or I need to read faster or I need to, you know, do something to speed up my studying. Like that would be a metacognition skill, like to monitor your own pro progress and make changes as necessary to achieve the task you're trying to get, you're, you're trying to achieve. Okay, young children, by the way, do not have metacognition skills. They really don't. They have no, no understanding of, of their own thought process, uh, but they do develop theory of mind as a, as a first step. Theory of mind is the ability to understand that people, including themselves, experience and act on mental states. Uh, earlier when talking about infantile amnesia, I mentioned that young children, you know, very young children do not have a good sense of self, right? And, and theory of mind kind of is connected to the to that idea. The theory of mind is, is the understanding that your mind is unique and, and it's your own and what you think are your own thoughts and that they are different from other people's thoughts. And when young children are egocentric, remember I, I, a number of times I mentioned that they, if they can see it, they believe everyone can see it. Or if, if they, they, when they hide, if they can't see you, they believe you, you can't see them. So like, kind of like we have a shared thought. Very young children don't understand that we have, that we each have unique points of view and, and perspectives. And, and, um, and this includes things like beliefs, desires, emotions and also intentions so you know understanding that, that different people believe different things people different people like and desire different things i like chocolate ice cream but my crazy sister likes likes strawberry ice cream um you know different emotions you know so they start to realize that just because they're happy doesn't mean that other people are happy and intentions you know they, they start to understand that people are um Often they may do something even though they might have intended something else that, that intentions are sometimes different from actions. Anyways, this is, this is a, something that takes a long time to develop theory of mind, but once they begin theory of mind, understanding theory of mind that, that their mind is unique, then they can start developing metacognition, you know, and, and thinking about their own thoughts when they realize that their thoughts are their own. Okay. All right, enough about that. Okay, and that concludes the information processing section. There's just one final slide here. This is on page 266. I'm not going through this, this comparison uh, step by step. It's, it's looking at Piaget versus theory of core knowledge versus Vygotsky versus information processing theory and, and doing a few different types of comparisons. I, I think you should look at it and read, you know, read it over, um, you know, try to understand the comparisons that are being made here. I'm, I'm going to compare Piaget and Vygotsky on just a couple of items, 
okay? Not necessarily from the chart, but... Okay, first of all, both Piaget and Vygotsky, they both believe that children construct knowledge, that children are actively constructing knowledge. Um, I really pointed that out when I talked about Piaget, Piaget that, you know, that, that he, he was one of the first to say that, yeah, children, like, you know, they're gaining knowledge on their own. They're constructing their own knowledge by interacting with the environment. Well, for Piaget, they can, as I just said, they construct knowledge interacting with the environment. For Vygotsky, children construct knowledge from interacting with others. And that is the difference. So in both cases, children are actively, you know, working on their knowledge. But in one case, it's the environment that they interact with. For Vygotsky, it's it's others, it's society and 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 other people. Okay, um, just one other difference I want to point out: uh, Piaget believed that he, he he believed that language expresses your thoughts. Okay, which is you know makes some sense. I mean, we use language to express what we're thinking. So. So your thoughts come first, and then you develop, you know, language skills in order to be able to express your thoughts. So it's kind of, kind of like language is a tool for me to express what's inside my head. For Vygotsky, language was more important, even more important than that. For Vygotsky, language shapes thought. So Piaget, language expresses thought. For Vygotsky, language shapes thought, meaning that the particular language that you learn is going to affect how you think. So the language just isn't a tool, it's actually changing your thinking. If you learn one language versus another, you will think differently. Um, there's not a lot of support for Vygotsky on this one. Uh, I'll, there was some research that was done showing that it it's, it is at least somewhat true but um i mean one of the uh, ex first examples that was studied was the fact that eskimos have like i don't know a dozen or 20 different words for snow or something like you know they have a, a special term if if the snow's slushy and a special term if it's wet or another term if it's if it's dry and another term for the snow, if it's, I don't know, flaky and another term if it's fluffy. And anyways, they have all these different snow words and we just, we got the word snow and we had adjectives. Maybe some, so the idea was, an early idea was Eskimos think very differently about snow. And this is because they have so many words in their language to describe snow, it, it, it affects how they think about snow. Anyways, this, this idea, like I said, there's not a lot of support. It, it turns out to be a little bit true in certain ways I'm not going to get into, but um, but on this comparison, probably, you know, Piaget was a little bit more accurate. Language expresses our thoughts rather than affecting and shaping how we think. Okay, and that will conclude Chapter 7. I know there was a lot of material here and some, and some long videos. Um, Thank you for your patience if you've watched all the way through. Have a great day.